let's talk about the PSA a little bit because we've yeah. alluded to it a number of times. So let's explain what it is, where it comes from, and, and more importantly, of course, how we use it. Yeah. So PSA is a, is a protein. It exists to aid in the liquefaction of semen. So it's produced by the prostate. And if one were to um, measure PSA in semen, it would be very, very high. I always tell people, if you looked at PSA in the semen, it would be, I don't know, 100,000 nanograms per milliliter of PSA in semen. It's designed to be there, and it exists there to liquefy the semen to help in the process of fertilization. It is not designed and it should not exist in the blood, but a certain percentage of PSA made in prostatic epithelial cells leaks into the bloodstream. And when we do a PSA blood test, we're measuring the PSA that has leaked into the bloodstream from a prostatic epithelial cell. Now, most of the PSA that leaks into the bloodstream is bound to other proteins. A certain percentage- and Is that like albumin mostly or sex alpha binding globulin? Alpha chymotryptin. Oh, so it's its own separate yeah. binding protein. Yeah, it has, that's the most common protein that PSA binds to, but it can bind to a family of three or four or four or five different- But these are prostatic proteins. Yeah. It's bound. Now, how much it's processed, because as you know, proteins just don't come out finished. They grow into the, their final state and they grow by shrinking, right? They get things snipped off of them as they're maturing and, and, and going through that process. As PSA is evolving in the normal kind of development of its exocrine function, it gets snipped into smaller and smaller states. Fully, fully processed PSA can float around in the bloodstream freely that's free PSA. So if you have a benign prosthetic epithelial cell, a lot of its PSA will be fully processed and ready to go in the ejaculate, let's just say. And if it leaks into the bloodstream, it can float around freely. You can measure it in an assay and it's what we call free PSA. A lot of the unprocessed or incompletely processed PSA is bound to protein. Alpha chymotryptin is the most common one. And that is what we would consider to be when we do a measurement of, when we're looking at total PSA, you're measuring mostly bound PSA and mm -hmm. some free PSA. And that ratio we use, you and I use in our practices to help discriminate against PSA that's in the bloodstream that may have leaked from a cancer cell or may have leaked from a benign epithelial cell. Now, there are other siblings of PSA that are also produced in prosthetic epithelial cells, of course, all in response to androgens. They're produced in those cells and they can also leak into the bloodstream. And we use those in some advanced PSA-based blood testing as well. But in general, when we are measuring PSA, we are measuring the amount of PSA, this protein, that's leaked from a prosthetic epithelial cell into the bloodstream. We can refine that value by saying how much of it is, how much is there and how much is free. If we have high amounts of free PSA, 30%, for example, then we can have good reassurance that most of the PSA in the blood that you're detecting is from benign cells. When most of the PSA that you have in your blood is, um, bound, very limited amounts of free PSA, that's a strong marker that there's something going on, i.e. that cancer cells are leaking the PSA into the bloodstream. Now, as I mentioned, you can also measure other byproducts, um, other, other types of free PSA or other sibling molecules to PSA. PSA is called HK3 or human calcine 3. You can measure, for example, how much of human calocrine 2 is in the blood. And these are part of it, more advanced PSA tests like the 4K score, or for example, the prostate health index. These are both mathematical equations that predict probability of aggressive cancers, but they're built off of looking at not just the PSA itself, but the PSA and how much other types of process PSA exist as well. Let's go back and talk a little bit about the free PSA. Um, does the amount of free PSA that we would want to see to be more assured of a benign nature of the PSA vary by age and absolute PSA level? Yes, it does. Um, so we begin to use 
the kind of free PSAs and the free PSA ratios and all those things when PSAs have crossed over a certain threshold, right? Because yeah, typically a lab, if you if your PSA is one, uh, we can't even get a lab to check a free that's PSA. Right. That's right. Because we know if you're P if you're screening someone and your PSA is one, then the chances you the probability of a prostate cancer that's lethal is incredibly low, right? So that's why they they just don't they don't have the assay set up to check it. And oftentimes, or some labs will not do that, you know, secondary default testing unless it's over four, for example, yes. or over two point five. We our lab set up to do everything at low at levels as low as two. So you can get them at lower levels, but in general, the idea is well, if your PSA is below two, the probability you have a lethal prostate cancer is you know less than one in a million. So we don't have to worry about that individual, and we really want to use the percent free PSA to discriminate yep. individuals who have elevated PSAs and having it discriminate between elevated because of BPH and elevated because of a cancer. So yes, and as and you get older your prostate enlarges as we talked about metabolic syndrome causes your prostate in, in large part to grow all you know just because mm -hmm. of the t to e ratios mm -hmm. um as it gets as you get older your prostate gets bigger so you we begin to use that in in as you get older and your prostate gets bigger you can have a proportional rise in total psa in your bloodstream just because your prostate's bigger and it's leakier but you can easily tease that out by looking at the percent free PSA. So if the percent free PSA is over 18 to 20, then you can be rest pretty well assured that that's likely not coming from some aggressive bulky tumor. What about with prostatitis when we see these huge spikes? Everything in goes PSA. up in those, ca in those cases, but- But does the free still remain disproportionately high? Well, it's a good question. I don't use free PSA yeah. in people because, because I'm you know tracking what the etiology. I'm is. tracking it. I'm literally looking for trends for coming back down to a new baseline. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about two other ways we use the PSA: the yeah. density and the velocity. How do those work? Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, as you get older, your prostate on average gets bigger. Not for all men, but for many men. And when that happens, your PSA can concordantly rise because it's just your prostate gets bigger and gets equal it's equally leaky so the PSA can kind of go up. Now what we look at is the ratio of the prostate the PSA value to the prostate volume. And that as you alluded to is called PSA density. And in general when I when I educate patients I tell them well we want a a PSA to be about 10% of the volume of the prostate or less to kind of be in a safe range. So if your PSA is four and your prostate's 40 grams, which is a, about average size for a 60, 65 year old guy. That's a PSA density of 0.1. We know that that is correlated with a low risk of having an aggressive prostate cancer. So when, when I'm looking at someone's case, I want to know what their PSA density is. If the PSA density in a young man, frankly, is more than 0.1, I get a little worried. Mm -hmm. If on an average age person, if the PSA density is more than 0.15, I also get, I start saying, let's do some additional testing. Mm -hmm. So I put every, you put everything together, but yes, PSA density predicts likelihood that you'd ever be diagnosed with prostate cancer. It predicts aggressiveness of a cancer if you're diagnosed with it, and it actually predicts your outcome if you have a prostate cancer. So the higher your PSA density, the more significant your disease will be. So the faster it increases. And the faster that your PSA rises, it is a canary in the coal mine to say, hey, you need to do some additional evaluation. Now, it doesn't mean you have prostate cancer yep. because I often have, and we share patients where their PSA went from one to five, but they had, we, we, we tracked it and it came back down because they had a flare up or inflammation in their prostate that made their PSA go, sometimes we don't know why, often mm -hmm. we don't know why, but if you track it, you can see that. So whenever somebody in general comes to see me, with an elevated PSA, the first thing I always do is just recheck it because there can be transient rises in the PSA. Now, as you know, we have very similar practice. I don't just recheck the PSA. I always order advanced PSA-based testing. What does that mean? That is testing that involves looking at the percent free PSA and then other things like minus two pro PSA for the prostate health index test or the 4K score, which basically will looks at 
different calocrines and their ratios. So, And you and I discussed these tests in great detail in the first podcast, so we can yeah. also refer people yeah. back to those um, so that I won't make you re-explain them. But um, it does surprise me that the official screening guidelines for prostate cancer uh, don't make any recommendation on the use of PSA testing other than something benign like discussed every patient should discuss this with their physician, which is a, a real cop out in my view of what we should be doing. Is that still, is that? Well, it depends on which guideline you're looking at. So the American urology. Th this was the, this is the, the guideline. US of, Preventative Services This is the Task US Force. Preventative Task Force yeah. and the CDC. Yeah. Um, and there's one other that is. Yeah, the American Cancer Society, uh, the American Urology Society, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. They're a little bit more progressive. They really suggest that you should talk about the risks and the benefits of screening. They kind of skirt around the idea of, well, how do you properly screen for, well, AUA and, 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 and the American Cancer Society don't get into details up front. They say, start the discussion with like, what's your potential risk for developing prostate cancer? You can ascertain that with the family history. Mm. Again, if you're reading the AUA guidelines or the American Cancer Society guidelines, you already have a leg up on the average internist because an average internist is just looking at general things they learned in med school or the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which is too general and too vague. So yep. I totally agree with you. I like and personally reference everybody to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network's prostate cancer screening guideline. That basically says that every man at age 45 should have a baseline PSA. Because as you mentioned, changes over time are key. They're critical. And you want to know where you are in relationship to the median, right? So a 45-year-old man's median PSA between 0.5 and 0.7, somewhere around there. Understand your median PSA. And then if your PSA is below one, you could just get reach you can get rechecked in two to four years. If your PSA but, but Ted, isn't I mean the, the test is free. It doesn't cost anything to do a PSA. It is. Why wouldn't we do this every single year? You, I guess the argument against it is that um, there can be natural variations in P. Again, if you're a smart physician, you're going to pick up that, hey, there's natural variations. And if it goes up from 0.7 to 1.5, I'm going to recheck it and it's still in a safe range, et cetera, et cetera. I think that. But that's, isn't that all the more reason to do frequent testing if there's natural variation? Because it also means that if you're testing infrequently, you're more likely in the presence of natural variation to miss what the actual trend is. Like think of the following thought experiment, right? So yeah. I love doing the thought experiment. So my yeah. thought experiment with colorectal cancer is imagine you had a low cost, zero risk, Colonos, you know, colonoscopy that you could do on somebody every month. Yep. Would you eliminate colorectal cancer? Yes. There'd be no such thing as colorectal cancer. Yes. Right. The third leading cause of cancer death is gone if you have that. Now, the reason we don't do that is they're not free and they're not risk free. Yeah. Okay. Well, similarly, imagine you had just like we have a continuous glucose monitor, a continuous PSA monitor, yeah. you could slap yeah. on somebody's arm, and you could for free, basically measure their PSA yeah. over their lifetime. I would argue there would be no such thing as lethal prostate cancer, because provided you had the AI engine and the physician to monitor this, you would you would know, oh, you know, Johnny yeah. rode his bike, Johnny had yeah. sex, Johnny, you know, had a urinary, had a, had a prostate infection, but you would, you would very quickly be able to pick up signal from noise. Yeah. I, well, I think I don't disagree with you. It's just a matter of how frequent, what, what is considered to be intensive PSA testing, right? And so but annual- let's just say annually, right? Well, annual PSA testing is very intensive. So all the trials that showed that screening for prostate cancer with the PSA test those trials had tested whether or not that reduced deaths, which they showed it did by 20 to 25%, was PSA testing every two to four years. So that's the baseline. So what we do in the U.S. But is can we do better is my point. Because to your point, it's still the second leading cause of cancer, death. It is. It is. And the, the, the real question is, um, which we don't know the answer to, is which, were those men that ended up dying of their prostate cancer offered early screening or not? Yeah. And that's, we don't know that. And then the other thing is with a little bit more of an invent, uh, with a little bit more of an investment in knowing prostate size, if you could now get that prostate density. So now if you yeah. have 
from one blood measurement that costs less than a pack of gum, you know your PSA, you know your free PSA, you know your PSA density. Yeah. That's really powerful. Yeah. By yeah. the way, a 4K test is a thousand dollar test. Yes, you don't right. need to do you it don't need if it. you know PSA, free PSA, and PSA density. Yes. And many would argue that pack of gum, chiclets, <laughs> those three things. Chiclets, those three I think it's things. Cheap. They're cheaper than a pack of gum. But yes, I think well, the PSA density is the more expensive. But part. you could, but you can get that off an ultrasound. You which can, is, which is it's free, basically. It's free. I mean, time for the. Yeah, you don't need but, to do an MRI. The bottom line: people would argue that percent free PSA gives you some uh, a strong correlation between size, the size. Yep. So yes, I I totally agree with you. I'm just pushing back, Ted, because, uh, I mean, I, look, you and I want the same thing, but yeah. I view this as a, I don't, I view, look, there are certain things that I don't see a clear step on the horizon for the elimination, right? Like, yeah. I don't see an immediate step on the horizon for people not dying of pancreatic cancer. Yeah. I don't see, sadly, an immediate step on the horizon for people not dying, women specifically, breast. of breast yeah. cancer, but I sure as hell see with the existing technology, a reason for people not to be dying of colorectal cancer and men not to be dying of prostate yeah. cancer. I mean, the deaths from prostate cancer with PSA screening have plummeted. So yeah. that's the one thing. But and it's we, still 35,000 men died last year. And so the question- the question is, I, I, would, they, would they have not, how many of them would have been saved with a traditional screening? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and trust me, I'm trying to defend the rule makers that made these rules that, that, that I was not involved with. But I would say that the, this idea of baseline PSA testing at age 40 on a population health level, where that all came about was from, from bank serum out of you know, Sweden. And so yep. they were able to mo model that pretty well to understand what's your overall lifetime risk for developing or dying from prostate cancer. If your PSA at age 40 or 50 is below the median, then your lifetime risk is very low, remember? Yep. So we have some information about it and the modelers, this is the best that they could come up with I'm not disagreeing with you. I don't, there's no, there's no reason in my mind why you should not get your PSA tested at an early age, understand your baseline and track it over time, which is I, what I, I do. I think the other, think the you other lesson too. you and I have both witnessed personally is the patients need to take ownership of this. Yeah. We have both seen tragic cases where individuals who have no medical training, but who like listen to this podcast, for example, uh, have diagnosed their own prostate cancer, even when their physicians have said there's nothing wrong with you. Yes. Based on advanced metrics, such as PSA velocity and PSA density. And, 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 and that and, to me and, is and infuriating no, yeah. and yeah. heartwarming at the same time. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's, and, um, and many of those cases that we share are, are not like the subtle, you know, one in a thousand cases. They're like the ones that are like obvious. Yep. So I, I do think that patients can own this and this is a key part of their overall health. 100% agree with that. And I think that you you know I mean it's and it's the it's the mindset of the of the individual patient that also matters because there are some patients that don't want to be proactive and progressive about how they 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 monitor their health. Now those are people who you probably don't take care of at all. But I I you know sometimes I'll see them. Yep. And so yes, we have to balance knowing early with overreaction and kind of over treatment of a potential issue that may arise. So there's subtlety to it. Can it be done well? I believe it can be done well. Mm -hmm.